Good morning, everybody. I am Council Member Stephen Levin. I am going to be opening this hearing, sitting in for chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection, uh, Costa Constantinidis. Um, the chair will be joining us later on. Today, this committee will address the mayor's fiscal 2021 preliminary budget for the Department of Environmental Protection. The department's proposed fiscal 2021 expense budget totals $1.39 billion and proposed capital commitment plan totals $10.5 billion over five years. The committee looks forward to hearing more about the agency's <coughs> capital investment strategy to maintain water treatment and supply systems citywide, the new needs and savings proposed in the pre preliminary plan, and agency performance metrics. Commissioner Vincent Sapienza of the Department of Environmental Protection will be providing testimony today, and I will hand it over to him at this point. Good morning, Council Member Levin. I uh, just want to thank the members of the committee, Chair Constantinidis, for the collaboration that we've had over the last several years. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I am Vincent Sapienza, the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, or DEP, and I'm here to speak about the FY21 preliminary budget and the FY20 preliminary mayor's management report, or PMMR. Uh, joining me at the table today is our Chief Financial Officer Joseph Murin, Deputy Commissioner Michael Deloach, and we have members of our senior team uh, behind us to help answer questions. DEP is dedicated to protecting public health and improving the environment. We provide clean drinking water, collect and treat wastewater, and work to reduce air, noise, and hazardous materials pollution. We provide water to more than half of the population of New York State while caring for our watershed lands, ensuring that the highest standards of quality are met, and thoroughly maintaining a distribution system that is more than 7,000 miles long. Our wastewater collection system incorporates expansive blue belts and rain gardens to reduce urban flooding and improve harbor water quality, which is the cleanest it's been since the mid-1800s. Our 14 in-city wastewater resource recovery facilities comprise the largest municipal treatment network in the United States. In addition, we handle hazardous materials emergencies and toxic site remediation, oversee asbestos monitoring and removal, and enforce the city's air noise codes. Um, just to talk a little bit about our in-city water and sewer main investments. Uh, New York City's water and wastewater systems are among the most reliable in the country. The 30 largest U.S. cities average 25 breaks per year for every 100 miles of water main, significantly above the industry best practice goal of 15. Our system averages six breaks here in New York City, which is second only to Boston. Still, when breaks do occur, city residents and commuters can be significantly impacted, as demonstrated during three breaks this past winter uh, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan and the, this morning in Brooklyn at the, the, the Bedford L Station. Uh, be assured that DEP does not rest on its record of reliability as we continue to make major investments in water infrastructure. We also have ample resources at the ready in all five boroughs to respond to breaks so that water service is restored to affected customers in an average of less than five hours. To continue progress and try to beat Boston, we intend to increase our proactive maintenance activities, including electronic leak detection and valve upgrades, uh, and accelerate main replacements. I'd also like to address the devastating sewer backup that occurred in late 2019 in South Ozone Park, Queens. As I discussed at a hearing before this committee this past December, the blockage was caused when a section of reinforced concrete sewer that was constructed by New York State only 32 years earlier catastrophically collapsed under a highway bridge abutment that was concurrently built. Given the major impact to the community, DEP staff has since worked diligently, first to pump more than 10 million gallons a day of the neighborhood sewage past the blockage, while concurrently building 1,200 linear feet of new sewer to replace the 1987 pipe. This new sewer was completed a few weeks ago, and the bypass pumping system was removed. Uh, I want to talk now a little bit about watershed investments upstate. Uh, while we continue to devote resources on maintaining our in-city infrastructure, we have not wavered from our focus on maintaining the reservoirs, dams, aqueducts, and tunnels that deliver water from our upstate watersheds. We've recently reached the milestone in the $158 million project to rehabilitate more than 74 miles of Catskill Aqueduct, which delivers about 40% of the city's drinking water each day. This aqueduct, perhaps the most complex water conveyance structure in the world, was shut down for 10 weeks during November, December, and January. The shutdown allowed more than 200 staff members to clean the inside of the structure, repair leaks, and replace valves. The shutdown was completed without affecting the reliability of the city's water supply. 
The work will improve the aqueduct's function and allow more than 40 million additional gallons of water to flow through the aqueduct every day, which will be needed when the Delaware aqueduct is shut down for major repairs in October 2022. The combined work ensures that New Yorkers will have reliable delivery of water for generations to come. In addition to upgrading this infrastructure, DEP also diligently protects our watershed lands to ensure that our water is of the highest quality. DEP now owns more than 155,000 acres of protected land surrounding the reservoirs. From mountaintop to tap, we analyze New York City's drinking water nearly 2,000 times each day and fully complies with all federal and state water quality standards as well as our own expectations for excellence. We recently released the 2019 New York City Drinking Water Quality Report, uh, which is posted on our website. I want to briefly mention the work that DEP is doing to uh, address potential long-term climate impacts on our award-winning water supply. Uh, DEP has research scientists who are conducting one of the most complex and in-depth studies of climate change on any water utility in the world uh, to help us understand the effects of warmer temperatures, more extreme storms, and long-duration droughts. The study will help to inform necessary operational modifications and investments in the coming decades. Uh, just some successes and improvements that we've made uh, so far in fiscal 20, just to touch on a few areas. Uh, we've improved uh, in, in responding to air quality complaints and noise complaints, which are uh, responded to about 20% faster than last year. We've improved our time to resolve sewer backups from 4.1 hours to 3.5 hours. There have been 19% fewer complaints about catch basin clogs, and we've responded 15% more quickly. There have been 14% fewer complaints of water leaks, and we've resolved leaks 39% faster. Uh, and we have an effective wastewater treatment and stormwater management system that has helped improve harbor water quality to the best it's been in more than 100 years, bringing whales back to our waterways. So looking forward, DEP plans to build on these trends and expand our efforts in fiscal 21. We are expanding our green infrastructure programs to further improve harbor water quality and improve stormwater management. A critical component of this expansion is intro 1851, which expands our MS4 stormwater control requirements to the combined sewered areas of the city. And we thank the committee and the chair for their sponsorship on this important bill. We're also redoubling our efforts to reduce idling. Uh, that's increasing air pollution in the city. We recently lost a, launched a $1 million anti-idling campaign with the support of the mayor's office. We hope that this behavior change campaign will be as successful as last year's Trash It, Don't Flush It campaign. Again, I want to thank you, uh, council member, and, and as well as the whole committee and, and Chair Constantinidis for your continued support of DEP's work. And I and my staff will be happy to answer questions that you have. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, let's see. So we'll start with um, uh, some of the um, uh, upstate land issues. Um, in the fiscal 2020 preliminary mayor's report, mayor's management report, DEP solicited less land upstate in the first four months of, 20, of fiscal 2020 at 4,837 acres when compared to the same period the year before with 8,261 acres. Um, why did DEP solicit less land and when will we see that number, and will we see that number increase by the end of the year? So, Councilman, let me say two things on that. Uh, first, as, as mentioned in the testimony, DEP has been purchasing property surrounding our watershed lands. We own 155,000 acres now, and, and those purchases have been going on for, for, for several years. We, we always do willing buyer, willing seller. So we'll solicit land from property owners as long as they're willing to, to sell their property to us at, at fair market rates, uh, the transaction will, will occur. Uh, over the years, we've seen fewer and fewer property owners willing to sell, I guess those that wanted to sell already sold to us, mm -hmm. uh, and we're seeing fewer. Uh, th this four-month total is a little bit of a statistical quirk, uh, just to, that a, a four-month period that was lower. But when we looked at the full calendar year 2019, uh, we, we, we met our targets uh, of, of, of solicitations, almost 40,000 acres. And uh, this year for calendar 20, we, we've targeted 35,000 acres. So we're, we're, we're at about where we need to be year over year. Um, and is there a, a long-term objective of, of that's of where you would like to be? That's the? 
Yeah, so we, we, we came into an agreement with the New York State Department of Health uh, and EPA called the Filtration and Avoidance Determination, and they set some targets for us uh, for, for land acquisition. Again, we, we would like to purchase properties of, of value to, to the city system to make sure that our reservoirs are protected. Um, with respect to the $3 billion state budget proposal, the Mother Nature Bond Act, do we know what, if any, of the funding would be earmarked for New York City? Yeah, so, so we don't yet. I guess this is going to be part of uh, the state's fiscal 21 budget. You know, we're, we're hoping that, you know, being half the population of the state, we get half of that money. Uh, we'll see. But, uh, you know, we'll, we'll certainly work with our partner agencies and OMB to make sure that we get our fair share. Um, obviously, it would be a shame if we weren't able to offset some of our city's costs with, with new state funding. So that would, that would uh, be something I'm, I'm assuming. Did, do, did we um, go to Albany during their budget hearing process to, to testify at their budget hearings? I don't know if we did, Council Member. Yeah, we can find out from our city ledge folks. Okay. It might be something good to, to follow up with, uh, with, the, with the mayor's office in, in Albany. Yep. Um, uh, understanding the uh, water rate setting process. Uh, in fiscal 20, a uh, 2.31 percent increase was proposed and implemented as the New York City water rate. As we approach fiscal 21, do you foresee a potential increase this coming year? So, uh, Council Member, what we typically do is come spring and April, May, uh, as we get towards the, the uh, executive budget, the adopted budget, uh, we'll, we will provide, DEP will provide to the New York City Water Board what, the, what our operating and maintenance costs uh, are, are expected to be, what they're budgeted for for fiscal 21. Uh, the New York City Municipal Water Finance Authority will also submit their information to the, the New York City Water Board about uh, what, what payments need to be made to, to bondholders to fund the capital work. And then the board will use that information to determine, and they have a rate consultant as well, as to what uh, the, the rate for the coming year needs to be. And they also look at projected revenues coming in through water bills. Uh, we don't have mm -hmm. that information yet. Uh, as we get further into the spring, we'd be happy to share that. So the determining factors on the, on the um, expense side of water rates is, is bond, bond payments? It's a, yeah, so, so I mean, there are a, other, are there other yeah, larger macroeconomic issues there? The, 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 the largest component, if you look at a pie, the largest component of what goes into the rates are the, the, the borrowing on the $30 billion um, that, that we've done over the years to, to build out the, the water and sewer system and to meet mandates. Uh, the other things are on the, you know, expense side is, is salaries, energy, chemicals, those things. Mm -hmm. um, once we, we get closer to what our fiscal 21 budget will look like, and then again, in consultation with the Water Board and the Municipal Water Finance Authority, they'll determine um, you know, what revenues will be necessary to fund the system in the next fiscal year, and that's how the rate gets set. Uh, I should also mention that once a rate is proposed, and generally in, in April or May, uh, we will hold, if there is going to be a rate increase, we will hold hearings in all five boroughs to solicit community input uh, before a final rate is adopted for uh, July 1st. Okay. Um, now, when a water rate is proposed, uh, does DEP or the Water Board provide a reconciliation of year-over-year -year costs that that impact, uh, the, that, in, that impact a set increase? Yeah, so yeah. I guess we've heard this uh, in the past from, from the committee as well, and that's something that uh, I guess as we get closer, Joe, I don't know if you want to respond to that. Uh, yes. Uh, we do have a reconciliation that we do do on between the, the expense budget as is put in the executive budget versus what may be in the water rate. So we will be able to go through and walk through the, for the council as well as for the public, you know, how that rate was derived at. So they'll be able to see the, uh, the transparency of how we're coming up with the numbers. You can provide that to this committee? Um, yes, we can, but uh, we, we have to get through the process first, and we have to propose it to the water board first, right. um, and then it's up to that in that period the, for the water board to then you know opine and determine whether you know that all makes uh, sense for in terms of what we need for the rate to continue both the uh, the revenue and the uh, the capital and the expense to maintain the system. And when would that be? Uh, as the commissioner said, we probably will be looking in sometime April, okay. early April, to have the water board meeting. So that should be a little bit concurrent with when uh, you know OMB should be coming out with the executive budget as well. Yeah. So so at our at this committee's executive budget hearing, that that should be available. Yes, that okay. should be. Great. Um, 
in terms of moving over to overtime spending, um, in the fiscal 2021 preliminary plan, $25 million was added in fiscal 20, and $35 million was added in fiscal 21 for uh, overtime and differentials. Um, first question is why, why hasn't the overtime budget been right-sized to accurately reflect actual spending as we anticipate it? Um, and secondly, what's the, where is this overspending coming from? Which division within DEP is required to do that much overtime? Yeah, and, and council member, that's exactly what it is. It, it, it's right sizing. So we've at DEP spent between 40 and $50 million a year in overtime for the last several years. Uh, that's actually less than 10% of our personal services budget. So it's not like we're, you know, folks are, are running up uh, big overtime tabs. Um, but that we had been budgeted for about $22 million a year from OMB that with, with the recognition that if we were to fill the you know, couple of hundred vacancies that we've, we have and, and hire new folks, it could potentially bring our overtime budget down to, to, to what was budgeted at 22 million. Uh, I think the recognition is now that there's, there's gonna be some level of, of headcount uh, vacancies and uh, so we're just right-sizing the, the working with OMB to right-size the, the overtime budget. And then how do we, um, what are strategies to better control spending with the understanding that you are an operational agency that runs 24-7, 365? Yeah, that's, that, that's uh, you know, an accurate statement. We have staff uh, on, at our wastewater treatment plants, on our water and sewer distribution, and uh, up in our watershed who operate the system seven days a week. Uh, we just make sure, as best we can, uh, that we have coverage on regular shifts. Uh, and not have to tap into overtime, and, and we think we do a pretty good job there. When emergencies do occur, you know, like water main breaks, uh, we, we do have folks on overtime. But again, our, our overtime over the last few years has been pretty consistent, uh, and, and uh, Chief Financial Officer and Joe Murin and I, every month we have a regular meeting. We go through overtime for each of our, our bureaus and uh, look at, look at mm -hmm. in, in certain trades where overtime spending is going, so we keep a pretty good eye on it. And how's, in terms of um, uh, hiring, um, is, there a, is there like an ongoing um, uh, continuous supply of applicants that are coming into some of these positions? Yeah, in, in, in certain titles, we, we've done pretty well in being able to hire and onboard, uh, you know, some, some other titles uh, just, you know, for whatever reasons and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe salary or just trades that are available, you know, economy is good and people find work uh, in, in private industry mm -hmm. um, but but overall our uh, overall um, I guess vacancy rate has is uh, and you may answer Joe is probably the lowest it's been in a few years yes uh, council member we so we normally probably back a few years ago we we're running about four to five hundred vacancy rate we're now down to out of the uh, headcount of 6,300 that's approved in the budget. Mm -hmm. We're down now to probably somewhere around between three in the 300 range. So that to go back to the commissioner's earlier response, you know, that has, you know, alleviated in the sense that we were using those vacancies um, to pay for, you know, to why we had to for the overtime. Mm -hmm. So now we've sort of right sized both those. We think that we're trying to stay ahead of the vacancy rate. Um, we do run into some issues in terms of particularly with the trades titles. You know, it's a very hot market out there, both mm -hmm. for, you know, construction, um, also for technical expertise. So it's also a problem in some of the engineering positions and in some of the uh, computer titles. But mm -hmm. we work closely with, you know, DCAS and with OMB in making sure that lists are established and we can call those lists as needed to be able to fill positions, you know, um, you know within the operations. Okay. Okay, so we've been joined by our chair. Um, not a moment too soon, because that was, you know. Um, but um, I, I, I want to ask one last question just about the, the water tunnel, the water tunnel number three. What is the, um, what is the, what, can you provide us an update as to when that's going to be fully operational? Hey, okay, I do have that. So city water tunnel number three, um, and, and, and I'm just, as, as I was talking, I was trying to re recollect what the, uh, the bid date is, but um, water, city water tunnel number three, the tunnel itself that's several hundred feet below ground 
uh, was completed uh, a, a, almost a decade ago. What we've since been doing is drilling the, the shafts from the surface uh, down, down to, the, um, down to the, the tunnel itself. There are two remaining shafts, shaft 17B and shaft 18B. Uh, the mayor committed that in, in fiscal year 20, the construction would start on those last two shafts. Uh, we recently advertised contracts uh, to do that work, and I, and I think it's, it's, it's the end of March. Yeah, the end of March, the bids are expected to be in, and work start this summer. Work start this summer? Yeah, on those, those final two shafts. How long, what's the construction schedule on those two shafts? Yeah, it's probably going to run through the mid 2020s. I'm going to say either, you know, probably 2026. We're looking at to to complete the shafts, all the distribution piping, and have that tunnel fully in service. Okay, so fully operational and in, in in within halfway through the decade. Yeah. That's your expectation. Okay. Turn it back over to the chair. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. I, I want to begin by thanking my colleague and my good friend and committee member Steve Levin for filling in uh, better than I could this morning. So thank you, Steve, for always being a great environmental leader in your own right. And thank you for uh, taking over for me as I got here a little bit late. Commissioner, good to see you. It's the chair, thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of jump right in. because I think we've already done the formalities already. So uh, you know, last year we passed uh, landmark legislation uh, in Local Law 97. And you know, we know that we need to combat climate change with the urgency that it deserves. So that last year, I know there was $60 million put into the budget for uh, retrofitting of city infrastructure to comply with Local Law 97. Uh, how much of that was possibly given to DEP? What are we thinking about in this year's budget? How are we looking at our DEP infrastructure towards these you know, retrofits to help get us to those very aggressive but achievable goals of, you know, 20, at 2025 and 2030. Well, while I'm speaking, I don't know, if Joe, if you can dig through and, and find the number, but uh, yeah, the yeah, the MOR. Yeah. Um, so just, Mr. Chair, bu a, bu a bunch of things. You know, our, uh, the facilities that, that DEP runs, uh, we, we, we know have a, a fairly significant uh, greenhouse footprint. They use a lot of energy for, for mm -hmm. you know, pump, pumping and, and treating wastewater. Um, and, and we've been doing a lot uh, to, to try to reduce that, including, uh, you know, com compliance with, with Local Law 97. Um, we've been looking at generating more um, of, of our on-site uh, biogas to use that as an energy source, uh, looking at things like, like solar and wind at, at our facilities. Um, so th there's a bunch of things we were doing. I don't know if we've got a number, Joe, on, on what... Uh, are there any, like, sort of substance... I mean, I know we're looking at a lot of things. Are there things that we are we putting into action as part of, you know, last year's budget or this year's budget that are concrete? that we can say that we're doing? Uh, I know we're studying a lot of things, but is there anything that's in the budget for this year's capital plan that, that sort of addresses these issues? Yeah. <clears throat> and, and, and Joe's got the, the resiliency numbers here, but um, you know, we, so, so that's some of it is, is resiliency work we're doing. But just, mm -hmm. just as, as far as climate change, uh, one of the things I, I, I do want to point out is um, we, we, I'm just talking about biogas. So at our Newtown Creek plant, uh, we, we generate biogas in the digesters. Yeah. We've been taking in food waste mm -hmm. uh, that waste management has brought in. And we, we expect to, because we do generate excess gas more than the plant can use, uh, sell that excess to National Grid. And we expect this summer uh, to have that fed into the, the National Grid pipeline. So, so that's one of the big things we do. We are working hard um, you know, towards our wastewater treatment plants being carbon neutral by 2050 so that um, the, the byproducts that we produce there can be used for, for energy and, and make us carbon neutral, and we're moving towards that. And how do we, well, how do we draw a map to get there, right? I mean, we know that that's, a, that's the goal that we want, but how do we sort of drill down over the next couple of years to make sure that we're actually doing those things, right? Because it's, you know, I have a goal to lose 10 pounds, but unless I figure out that if I stop eating cookies, I know that I'm not going to get there. So, like, you know, we have to kind of draw ourselves a map on how we get to the goal, right? 
We have, and, and our, uh, Jane Gujuani's not here, who runs our energy <coughs> office, but she's got a plan over the next 10 years anyway, uh, things we're doing, and, and, and again, it includes solar uh, at Ward's Island, we're, we're, we're looking at installing solar there and, and, mm -hmm. and have some funding to, to do that. So we'll, we'll certainly get you that list. Fantastic, and we talk, we, you know, we just, we just saw the president uh, tweet out, you know, he tweets every day, He's, uh, but you know when it comes to resiliency, you know he tweets out that New York City should get out our mops and buckets for the next storm. You know, we lost lives here in New York City. He should know that, and he should be respectful of that and rec recognize the seriousness to which the things that he speaks. But he doesn't understand how to do any of that ever. Uh, so we're left with a president who doesn't believe in climate change and has now pulled funding for the Army Corps of Engineers. So there is no cavalry coming over the hill to save us uh, from the federal government. Uh, so what are we thinking about um, with the loss of the Army Corps as a resource? How are we looking at our DEP infrastructure without knowing that the federal government's gonna be there for us? Now granted, we're gonna have a presidential election this year and we're all pulling to make sure that that's a win. Uh, but in the interim, we're stuck with a president that is, is sort of, not, you know, I'm trying to find something diplomatic, but he's someone that is attacking New York City on a daily basis. So what's our plan here with DEP infrastructure? Yes, Mr. Chu, we, um, during, during Hurricane Sandy, as you know, we suffered significant damage at a lot of DEP facilities. Uh, a lot of pumping stations were lost. A lot of our, our wastewater <clears throat> treatment plants were, were, were briefly down uh, while we made repairs. We, we actually put to guess, uh, together a list of resiliency projects that we've been actively working on, almost a half a billion dollars worth of those projects. Uh, if the Army Corps is going to walk away from, from, from this, we will continue to work uh, you know, with, with the council and OMB to make sure that our projects get funded nonetheless. So are we... Are there certain capital allocations that we're now going to have to make to make up for the Armor Corps? I've even, I know it's, you know, in between the mayor's sort of preliminary budget announcement and this hearing, the president announced this nonsense. Uh, so are we now, have we sort of had to reevaluate our capital plan to recognize that were there things that the Army Corps were funding or doing that we now are no not coming that we have to now make up the difference on immediately or, or do we have more time to figure that out? So, so from what we understand, it was, it was <clears throat> so far just a study that was defunded, but, but uh, other work that the Army Corps was doing uh, for a barrier war, wall in Staten Island, uh, some of the money, and I could talk, Joe, about HUD and FEMA money that we're getting, so that's still so on the table. much of the funding that we received or will be receiving has already been earmarked, so to speak, for the, uh, from the federal government. So those things are, for lack of a better word, in the bank for us, and some of that right. is the stormwater mitigation um, program and some of the resiliency infrastructure stuff that we've already taken underway. And this is what the commission referred to, some of the hardening at the plants, getting ready for making um, them more resilient in the f face of storm uh, surges and you know, <clears throat> climate change. Uh, the other studies, such as for the, you know, the barrier islands on Staten Island, those are the ones that I think are they're most at risk, and we have not yet um, earmarked funds totally for that. But as the commissioner said, as those projects progress, whether the Army Corps continues on them or not, we have a certain degree of, you know, acknowledgement whether it's in the budget or not, that we may have these as risk in the future that we would have to incorporate in stormwater measures, you know, whether it's the sewers or for the infrastructure that has to be done so that we can do uh, mitigation, you know, that will be considered, you know, in consultation with OMB and with the mayor's office as we proceed forward. So I would just add also, I know the, the bigger study was, you know, New, New York, New Jersey, a lot of our mm -hmm. partners. So I know they're already looking for ways to sort of fill that gap and figure it out it's larger than a DEP issue. We work closely with the Army Corps on a lot of projects, and we'll continue to. We're working mm -hmm. right now on Staten Island uh, uh, Barrier Wall. So thankfully, you know, we have good working relationship, relationship with them. We hope that continues. But we are, you know, as a state, working with our external partners, trying to figure out what we do in the gap of that. that yeah, because I mean, all of our wastewater treatment plants are in flood zones, right? So we are, uh, you know, time is of the essence to make these resiliency plans and, and sort of reconfigure our thought processes around the lack of federal involvement, right? Yeah. Which we have, and we've spent a lot, of, a lot of money and a lot of time in making sure that we're retrofitting all of our facilities. And, and, right, and as we said, if we have to spend city money, unfortunately, we, we will continue to make those investments. Uh, so looking at um, combined sewer overflow, 
right? Because it's only going to get hotter and it's only going to get wetter, right? And then as we're seeing more precipitation, we're seeing more CSO activity. So you, know, you look at the preliminary uh, capital plan includes 452 million uh, for construction of a combined sewer overflow retention tank in the Gowanus Superfund site in Brooklyn. Uh, what level of sewer overflow reduction do you anticipate at this site? So, so we've, we've looked forward and, and made some assumptions, Mr. Chair, uh, about how much uh, capture those, those two tanks, uh, <clears throat> totaling 12 million gallons, will achieve. It's about a 75% reduction in the current overflows that are going into the Gowanus Canal. And we've worked with EPA on what the, that right number is, and, and that's the number. We, as you may know, we had proposed uh, to EPA that instead of building a, a 12 million gallon uh, or two, 12, two tanks totaling 12 million gallons, we, we instead build a, a, a storage tunnel uh, mm -hmm. totaling 16 million mm -hmm. gallons, uh, but, but uh, EPA rejected that, that proposal. And, and what timeline do you anticipate to start and complete this project? So on the first of the tanks, the 8 million gallon tank uh, towards the head of the Gowanus Canal, actually construction is going to start uh, this summer uh, with the demolition of some of the buildings that are on the site. Uh, we're, we're getting close to wrapping up the design of that tank and then subsequent uh, to, to the demolition and site prep, uh, we'll then have work to, to start uh, the construction of that tank. We're also coordinating with National Grid, who's got some work to do to build a, a, a barrier wall uh, between the canal and, and, and our site. So that's all coordinated, but things are moving. Uh, we've done about uh, the design, I think, think we're, we're, yeah, 90% at this point on, the, on the, that, that tank design. And, and I know that there was talk about a tunnel or a tank under Queens, like Jackson Heights, East Elmhurst, you know, leading into Bowery Bay. What is, what is sort of the process there? What are we thinking? Yeah, so the proposal that we made to uh, New York State DEC, yeah, and, um, and, and, you know, had community involvement in was to uh, build a, a storage tunnel uh, to, to reduce overflows into Flushing Bay. Um, DEC has, su supports that and we continue to, to move that along and uh, have some funding in the budget to, to begin planning and design. And I believe we ha actually have uh, the design contract will be going out this spring um, for that tunnel. The design contract. Yes. Okay. So it's going to be a little while until we see the, that come to fruition. Yes. It's good. You know, it's expected to be over a billion dollars. Um, yeah, th thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll my colleague, I know he's representing Brooklyn, so I'll make sure that I'll give him the, the moment to kind of tag in here for, for this questioning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Commissioner, would you, would you mind pulling the microphone a little bit closer? Sorry. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, with the Gowanus um, uh, 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 water retention uh, tank or tunnel, what's the, what's the latest on um, DEP's assessment of where what the what the build out should look like and um, a timeline on that is a, so council member we have been working with EPA on, on what the the right configurations are um, EPA got back to us probably in December uh, that they wanted us to build uh, an 8 million gallon storage tank at the head of the canal and then uh, about a quarter mile south of there, a, a four million gallon tank. So we now know uh, what, what, what the, the sizing, the shape, the configuration, uh, we're, we're pretty much set on that. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the externals, uh, above ground structures we're still uh, discussing, but um, now the design of the eight million gallon tank, we're essentially done and, and work should start there soon. The four million gallon tank is probably a couple of years behind. And they, uh, EPA had preferred the, the tank versus the tunnel? Yeah, or, they, they, yeah. yeah they, they, when they uh, came out with their record of decision a few years ago, they proposed uh, a tank, which is just, you know, big rectangular shaped box uh, underground. We had instead proposed tunnels, and we're looking at, as, as the chair mentioned, we're looking at tunnels for Flushing Bay. We're looking at a storage tunnel for, for the Newtown Creek water body. Um, we think tunnels are just you know, more easy to construct and, and, and enlarge if you, if you need to, uh, rather than tanks. But uh, EPA was pretty adamant about the tanks, so we'll, we'll mm -hmm. go ahead and build those. Okay. Do you have a timeline then on, on what, go on, what those two Gowanus tanks will, when the build-out will likely happen? Yeah, so the, uh, the first tank, again, we, we expect to start uh, the construction for, for site prep and clearing this summer. Um, 
we, we, we can get you the timelines on both. Acquisition has happened already from the, on the property. Yeah, I would just add to, we're working with your office to schedule a community meeting in advance of the construction start in the summer. I think somewhere in the first week of May or so, we're working with Ben on, so. Okay. We'll keep everybody updated. Okay. Um, and um, do, you, do you have a sense of the timeline of the construction? We're, yeah, we'll get to that. So uh, the first tank is is soon. The second tank is is probably a couple of years from now. But I just meant how long how long it would oh, take how to long? construct. Oh, yeah, yeah. well, we'll get to that. Ten oh ten ten to twelve years for full. Ten to twelve years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Before it's just, fully online. Yeah. Just on the land acquisition, I just want to add to uh, council member because it's it's uh, you know some of your constituents when when we uh, purchased the land, some of it was uh, through the eminent domain process uh, that, that the owners of the properties. Um, got full market value, but um, some of their tenants are still there, and we're working to, to have them move out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, that's a, okay. So ten to twelve years. Oh, that's a that's a pretty um, uh, long timeline in terms of. So that's inclusive of both projects. So the, the oh, project, the first, the earlier side, will be um, shorter in some way, right? So we'll get you the timeline, but that's the full for for both sites and the full construction. So. Yeah. Okay. It's not 12 years on the site that you're specifically thinking on. So we'll get right. you the timelines. Okay. Okay. Um, and then uh, have you already, uh, and so f for the budget, the budgetary impact of that, have you, have you already um, started the process of uh, scoping out the capital funds necessary to do that? And um, At this point, it is not fully funded. It's not fully funded. Um, OMB, and we are all aware of that, and the consideration is that we want to get closer to having the design, and then when we put the construction out to bid, uh, since we have no, you know, we have an, an estimate, but we're not clear yet as to what's going to actually be, what the market's going to be like, and what the bids are going to come in at. But we feel that it's, I'm sorry, but, but yeah, but we, we know that it's, we, we are going to need additional funding for this. Okay. And when do you expect that that would be, that that would, you'd have a sense of, of what that, the bids I, would when, be? When, we, when the bids go out for, uh, for the construction of the tank itself. And that'll be? I believe it's in for either it's 21 or 22. I don't have it right here, but I'll, I will, we'll get back to you on that one. But it's, it's going to be imminently, so, yeah. And just actually as a, this is a OMB question, I guess, more that, you know, the, with, with, with um, uh, a bond, Yields being as low as they are right now, um, is that is that impact when we when we look to borrow on on capital projects like this? No, it's more the consideration is when is the project going to be ready for you know going out to bid? When is the construction timeline? What is the mandated you know schedules that we have to meet on this, mm -hmm. um, particularly on this one because it is much more driven by what the requirements are for you know working with the EPA and getting the uh, meeting the milestones. Um, and then, sorry, just I uh, want to pivot one one more question, Chair, if that's right. Um, uh, Newtown Creek, uh, Nature Walk, Phase Two and Three. Is there an update there? Yeah, sure. So, so the work is underway. As you know, you can probably see when you drive down Greenpoint Avenue, um, that's that's moving along fairly well, and we expect sometime next year to uh, be able to have folks traversing uh, beyond Phase One. That's that's been there for about ten years. Um, is, and, and there's, a, we've been in some discussion through my office of, of that connecting uh, parcel uh, down to Greenpoint Avenue. Um, I think obviously that would make a, a huge impact in terms of kind of, of connecting um, the entire Greenpoint community, being able to go uh, continuously fr from, from one side, you know, from uh, northwestern Greenpoint over to um, McGowick Park and, and, and that area. Um, and so is there, I know that there's a little bit of a gap in, in capital funding there. Um, uh, it wouldn't be a terribly huge amount and, you know, within the scale of Newtown Creek Wastewater Treatment Facility, which has, you know, been five or six billion dollars over the last 20 years. So is there, um, I mean, it would be great if we could work together to figure out how to get the capital funds necessary to to make that a connection in light of the fact honestly that the 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 building that was built to be temporary uh, has now gotten a permanent CFO and that was going to be a temporary building and that land was supposed to be given back to the community so there's there's a little bit of um, some um, residual feelings about that within 
within the folks that have been following this for a while, and that, that includes, you know, our friends at Nickmick, who, um, or, or the erstwhile Nickmick, um, who I met with a couple weeks ago, and it came up. No, that, 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 that's fair, and uh, yeah, we've, we've been talking to the community now about this parcel uh, at the east end of the wastewater treatment plant, and you know, they've, they've got a very good visioning, and we've looked at what they want to do, their, their gateway to Greenpoint, and uh, you know, we, we'd like to help them as we can, and we'll continue to work towards that. Okay, thanks, Commissioner, thanks. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Levin, thank you. Uh, just want to go to talk quickly about the long-term control plan. Uh, with uh, respect to the long-term control plan and the open waters plan, what is the current amount of discharge of sewer material in our local water bodies, and you know, what do you believe that this plan is going to, how is it going to address that? Yes, so Mr. <clears throat> Chair, you know, we, we've heard a lot from the community. We, we submitted the, uh, the, uh, the last of our plans for the open waters, and um, you know, I guess a, a lot of the comments were, well, half of your annual CSO discharges go into the open waters, you know, why aren't you more significantly funding uh, that water body? Um, you know, we, we've been working with uh, New York State DEC for many years, and the, the, a, our thought process has always been to uh, spend the money where waters are most impacted. So the more significant funding uh, has gone towards, as you know, we talked about Flushing Bay and Newtown Creek, <coughs> where we have billion dollar plus projects going into those water bodies, which are, are again, may, maybe some of the worst in the city. Uh, the open waters, many of them actually meet bathing standards, and um, the, the investments that we thought we'd make there, at least now up front, uh, were, were less than you know, what, what other of the you know, dozen water bodies around the city got, and so we've been getting a lot of uh, feedback about that. We'll continue to work with the community and, and with the state uh, to see if there are other things that can be done. In, in formulating these plans, are we taking into account um, the increased precipitation that we're going to see due to climate change. Are we, you know, we realize it's only going to get hotter and it's only going to get wetter. So as we know what's going to get wetter, are we, are we sort of meeting the, the challenge where it is now, or are we meeting the challenge where it's going to be five years from now, where you know, we know it's going to get wetter, so there probably is going to be more discharge. How, how are we sort of balancing the now versus what the projections say that we're going to be? No, that's a very good question. And, and in the LTCPs, we've made some assumptions, you know, whether those assumptions turn out right or not. Uh, but, you know, we are certainly concerned. We've seen significant cloudbursts in the last few years, uh, you know, par part of uh, Brooklyn um, last year uh, in Park Slope. We had a, a storm with over three inches of rain in an hour. So, you know, it's certainly concerned that, again, the LTCPs did make some assumptions. And, you know, we'll continue to fine tune those as time goes on. But the foundation of those assumptions were based on sort of rainfall based on now or projections that we have for five, ten years out? Yeah, it was based upon uh, an average. They, they looked at the last, you know, 20 or 30 years of, of rainfall data. Mm -hmm. They came up with a, a synthetic average and they used that, but they did make some assumptions about additional rainfall to come. And how about on green infrastructure? I know, our, our, what are our foundations when it comes to green infrastructure? Where are we? Um, are we getting it in fast enough? Are we basing some of this plan on meeting a timeline that we might not meet? So that's sort of a question that I, I'd want to see through. No, that, that's an important question, too. So uh, green infrastructure is an integral part of our, our long-term control uh, strategy for CSOs. We have over 4,000 uh, rain gardens in the ground. Uh, we, we, we announced a few months ago the construction of, of 5,000 more assets. Uh, so we are moving relatively quickly. I think we're, we're starting to get to the point where we say be beyond these, these nine or 10,000 assets going in, where do we go next? Um, and that's been a little bit more challenging because uh, we're finding in some areas of the city just not the right uh, subsurface characteristics uh, to be able to use. So we want to, to the maximum extent, use green infrastructure both in the city's right of way and induce private uh, developers and private building owners to, to soak up stormwater on their sites because it makes sense, I think, to everybody to manage that, that runoff and, and use the, the subsurface rather than have that runoff and go into the sewer system and into our open waters. And how are we doing on sort of educating the public around these, the importance of this green infrastructure? Because very often, you know, what is our budget for doing outreach? What are our budget to keep, the, I know that the mayor had talked about keeping tree pits clean and, and 
how are we doing that um, to sort of make sure communities understand this? So these are really important projects that are in their neighborhoods. Yeah, I'll have Michael talk about the outreach, and then I'll get back to the, the cleaning of them. Yeah. Sure. So in advance of people uh, receiving an asset, we send them uh, a letter explaining sort of the benefits and significance of the project. And we do also give a, a door hanger as <laughs> the construction is taking place. We have uh, everything connected to 311. We have an internal hotline that we use to answer questions about maintenance or construction issues. So, um, you know, we've done a, a lot into those communities where they're directly receiving the assets. Broadly, we probably have more we could probably do, so we'll look into sort of educating the greater public. But our biggest concern is those uh, property owners that are receiving uh, the, the green infrastructure, having them understand, you know, why it's so important, why the inconvenience is sort of worth some of it, um, and then ways for them to access us if they have issues or problems that they need us to fix. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's drawing that straight line, right? I mean, they very often they're not making the connection that this right. piece of green infrastructure is actually going to help their keep their homes from flooding. Yep. But we have to make sure we're, we're drawing those straight lines for them, right? Yeah, so we're reaching them numerous times to help educate them on the benefits, and we'll continue okay. to. Well, uh, one of the complaints you get, and you mentioned it, Mr. Chair, is just uh, is trash. And, um, you know, we, we've seen um, some <clears throat> particular uh, rain gardens, primarily in, in commercial areas, and, been, you know, commercial boulevards where uh, trash has accumulated. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we've heard it from the, the controller's office as well, did a recent audit. Uh, we, we are putting additional resources. Every year we hire um, it, their city seasonal park workers, and they work for us from, from March through November. Um, and we're going to be increasing that, that labor force uh, this season to just make sure we stay ahead of that. Okay. And then we're you know, sort of pivoting back to the long-term control plan. This is all part of that conversation. What sort of outreach are we allowing for the public to comment? Uh, how are we making sure that communities are being heard around these, these long-term control plans, and in particular, the open water plan? Yeah, I'll, I'll start, and then Michael can jump in. But we, we've, we've had regular public hearings. I think you know, some folks in the community, and especially the environmental groups, uh, want to have uh, more input on the, the actual writing of the plans. And um, you know, I think that's some concern that we've had between the city and DEC is if that is going to delay the process. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would just say we do extensive outreach. We hold numerous <clears throat> meetings across the five boroughs. Uh, we allow time for comment. Originally, we weren't really giving uh, a full overview of our proposals that we were submitting to the state. We have since changed that, uh, adhering to the, sort of the suggestions of the advocates in uh, giving them a fuller overview of what the what the submission will include. Uh, we have to work with the state with that because we're we're only able to do what we can do and and what the DEC allows us to do in that process. So we've already sort of pushed that as far as we think we can. So um, I know there's still some you know unhappiness, but you know maybe they can help uh, us with our partners at the state uh, figure out what else we can do because I think we've sort of exhausted what the city is able to do and we're, we're you know giving as much uh, transparency and disclosure as we can so i'm i'm trying to make sure i'm following maybe i'm i'm not following so sure. you're saying the state is limiting our ability to do more that we want to do more and maybe the state is keeping us from doing a better job on they're, i'm not saying necessarily <laughs> they're limiting i'm just saying that i think we've pushed it as as far as we feel comfortable and how much information we can give in advance of our submission uh, i can t explain a little bit more of the legalese but um, we have, in the past year or two, again, ramped up our, our information sharing and given them a full perspective of alternative solutions and the way we formulated our, our submissions um, above and beyond what we had previously, sort of listening to what they were looking for. I definitely, keep me a, I definitely want to know as we move forward on this, the public outreach that we're doing and how we connect to communities and the different members of our committee. Um, and then lastly, uh, I know that there are lots of different capital projects. Uh, in the city of New York, right? We have SCA, you know, we, we libraries, parks. We have all these different capital projects that are going on. Uh, and, you know, the overall goal is to make sure they're both sustainable and resilient. How are we coordinating? Because uh, it's not necessarily, the money's not given to DEP, right? The money's given to the Parks Department, the money's given to SCA, the money's given to the libraries, where DDC is doing the work. How are we doing with our interagency coordination on these capital projects where, you know, sometimes we're getting some really great coordination and sometimes we're not getting as, 
as, as close of a coordination? How do we sort of close that gap for every project that, this is, that DEP is involved with stormwater capture and uh, in this sort of this, and these big capital projects? So, so I, uh, Mr. Chair, I think we, we coordinate uh, rather well, particularly on projects that are being delivered by the New York City Department of Design and Construction, uh, who's doing a, a lot of that work. And, um, you know, they understand our stormwater rules. Uh, just, just like any private entity, they, they, they have to come to DEP uh, for, for looking at site connections for, for sewers and water mains. Uh, and so we have a good look at the project at that point. Um, you know, they're, they're certainly both city regulations and local laws that have to be complied with. Uh, but again, I think D DDC has a really good handle of what, what the requirements are for storm drainage in particular. And I would just add, you're clearly sponsoring a bill that's going to add, you know, expand sort of our stormwater management in non-CSO areas. So I think um, standardizing that and also making sure that all of our rules speak uh, clearly and, and in unison will be helpful in making sure that, you know, it's clear for people to adhere to our, our rules. Uh, we're, we're looking forward to hearing that in April. So um, with that, uh, I don't have... Yes, yes. Biosolids. I almost closed without biosolids. How could I do that? <clears throat> so so how, how are we doing in, how much are we spending on biosolids? You know, what is our sort of long-term plan for beneficial reuse? I mean, what, what, what are we sort of thinking here? Because I know it costs us an awful lot of money to transport uh, our biosolid. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask Joe to get the, the number and I'll ask Deputy Commissioner Pam Alardo to come up. Uh, just, just to tee Pam up, um, we, we've been pushing more and more to, to beneficially use our biosolids. Uh, about 80% goes to either <coughs> landfill or mine reclamation. About 20% is being composted, but Pam's got a great plan going forward towards 2030. So I'll just ask Joe if you want to just chime in on what the, the spending is. So, uh, Mr. Chair, as of uh, for fiscal year 19, we spent uh, we had a budget of 56 million dollars. We spent 61 million dollars, um, so it was slightly up from the prior year where we had spent 53 million dollars. We have been seeing um, cost increases, particularly because of the transportation, um, you know, issues that we're confronting with the biosalts, and you know, Deputy Commissioner Lardo can go into that more. And um, we've been having ongoing discussions on this matter, both internally as well as with OMB in terms of how do we uh, manage the biosolids. Okay, $61 million a year sounds like a lot of money. Yes. And, and uh, oh, Pam, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a hearing without getting you up here. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I was wondering when I get my chance. Um, yes, biosolids is obviously a big component of our business, and it's not something we could just turn off, right? We produce, uh, we produce organics from our mm -hmm. system. Um, we've got a multi-pronged pr approach to take what we have now and move into the future of 100% beneficial reuse. There are a lot of drivers. <clears throat> the existing method we're using is not only increasing in cost, it's much uh, increasing in risk as well. The risk being landfills are starting to close, people are, don't want to take biosolids, transportation uh, could be a problem. There's a, an extent of uh, issues at landfills. And that's a risk. Um, and then there's also the carbon benefits of utilizing our biosolids beneficially, which we need to take care of because it's a big component of us becoming uh, energy neutral. There's a 2030 uh, New York City zero waste to landfill. And so that's our target, to get the biosolids out of landfill by that trajectory. So there's a number of investments we need to make. We need to invest. Um, in our solids processing components of all our wastewater resource recovery facilities so that we can get to the quality of biosolids necessary for beneficial reuse. And that is the trajectory we're starting to invest in now in multiple sites. Um, and then also working with the <coughs> private sector in terms of uh, availability for composting and, and other uh, potential land application or utilizations, mine reclamation, it's, it's a great product for that. So trying to get that community together externally from the city to uh, drive in that direction as well. So I'm an attorney, not a scientist, but I'll just I'll ask, is, uh, is anaerobic digestion something that we can use uh, biosolids in? 
Oh, so all of our wastewater plants <laughs> have anaerobic digesters on their facilities for this very reason, because okay. we take the solids and we digest them. So currently that digestion um, and, and, and many of our plants aren't quite there to meet the, the um, quality requirements, the time retention requirements. So this is where the capital investment comes in. And you, and you asked previously about, um, it's tied to the energy production, right? Because mm -hmm. in our anaerobic digesters, we produce the, the dye gas, and we actually do have a, um, a five-year plan to make uh, specific investments to increase our beneficial use of that dye gas, uh, again, tied to the whole uh, solids processing complex. So is, is, is building more anaerobic digesters a solution to deal with this $61 million? Like, do we wouldn't have to send out any of this? Or? No, building... Um, <laughs> I would say upgrading the existing digesters and solids processing complexes that we have throughout the city in every mm -hmm. neighborhood. Um, I should say in every borough, not in every neighborhood, uh, is required to us to get to that standard of, of beneficial use and also provide excess capacity for food waste. So it's tied, uh, tied in that sense. I know a place we can do that. But then it becomes, it becomes a valuable product as opposed to a waste, right? Mm -hmm. So now we're treating it um, for the most part about 80% like a waste but we're uh, transforming it into a valuable resources, which is really uh, the goal and the, the mission of the wastewater resource recovery world. Mm -hmm. and, and thus, that's why we're calling waste, uh, we're not only calling wastewater, we're talking resource recovery, right? But we are. <laughs> yep. So, all right, with that, I will, I thank you for your time. I look forward to seeing you back at this committee hearing uh, for our next budget in May. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Commissioner. Okay, so I have uh, two witnesses that are signed up to testify. I have Carter Strickland for the Trust for Public Land, and I have Phil Voss from Energy Vision. All right, good to see both of you gentlemen. Uh, Carter, I'll let you go first. Thank you, um, and thank you to the members of the committee and Chair Constantinidis um, for the opportunity to testify on DEP's budget for fiscal year 21. My name is Carter Strickland. I am the New York State Director of the Trust for Public Land, a national nonprofit organization that creates parks and protects land for people, ensuring healthy, livable communities for generations to come. I'm testifying today to support DEP's allocation of funds for green infrastructure and for working with community partners like the Trust for Public Land to manage stormwater runoff. For more than 20 years, uh, Trust for Public Land has had a partnership with New York City to renovate schoolyards owned and operated by the Department of Education. As part of our agreement with the city, these community playgrounds are then kept open for general public after school hours and on weekends. What does this have to do with DEP? Well, um, it has to do with green infrastructure. We've worked hand in hand with DEP and other city agencies to incorporate green infrastructure elements like trees, permeable pavers, rain absorbing gardens, and turf fields that retain stormwater into our playgrounds, which become multi purpose infrastructure that delivers recreational, health, stormwater, and urban heat island mitigation services for the residents of the city. I will say that the incremental cost of adding green infrastructure to another infrastructure project is a cost effective way to mitigate potential stormwater damage by collecting millions of gallons of runoff that would otherwise flood streets, overwhelm sewers, and pollute local waterways. 
The Green Infrastructure Playground Partnership with the Trust for Public Land allows DEP to extend the reach of the Green Infrastructure Plan to public schools, just as DEP's relationship with the Parks Department through the Community Parks Initiative extends green infrastructure to city-operated parks. <clears throat> While all of our playgrounds built over the past 20 years seek to maximize permeable features such as garden and tree pits, since 2013, we have worked with DEP's green infrastructure program to design our playgrounds to pitch runoff to storage areas under turf fields and on other features that have significantly increased retention. Since then, the Trust of Public Land has created 36 new green infrastructure playgrounds with another currently under construction. Of the 24 new playgrounds that DEP has helped fund, several have the capacity to divert over 1 million gallons of stormwater annually, and in total, the DEP Trust for Public Land sites collect over 18 million gallons of stormwater every year. With sites in four of the five boroughs, these playgrounds help improve the water quality for all New Yorkers while bringing the benefits of nature and public spaces to many. Going forward, we are working with DEP to retrofit some of our older playgrounds. We've built 210 to date uh, and counting. Uh, we're retrofitting some of the older ones that were built 10 or more years ago. These sites have mature trees and gardens that absorb a lot of rainfall, but generally they have first generation turf fields that do not absorb stormwater. During renovations, we will be working with DEP to remove those turf fields, add a gravel storage area underneath, and top it with modern turf. And we will be adding other green infrastructure elements where possible. Over the next five years, the Trust for Public Land will be working with DEP to retrofit 50 community playgrounds across the city. Um, I do want to add one comment that is not in my written remarks, but since uh, committee member uh, Levin uh, asked about the New York State Bond Act, which is currently a, just a proposal, uh, I will uh, put in a pitch that it does include dedicated funding for green infrastructure, $100 million, the proposals that have been floated uh, in the legislature. But there's no carve out there for New York City, and I think there should be. I think $50 million should be uh, carved out. Um, I urge the, this committee to work with the state delegation that represents uh, the city to make sure that happens. There's precedent for it. There's um, 75 million of 150 million carved out for New York City urban heat island mitigation and forestry, which is good. Um, the same should happen on, on green infrastructure. In conclusion, um, the Trust for Public Land urges the Council to support DP's budgetary allocation for green infrastructure partnerships with community partners such as our organization and others, uh, because this increases the scope and speed of these important public services and creates more friends for the best agency in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carter. Thank you. Mr. Voss, it was good to see you. <laughs> good morning. Good to morning. be back. Um, and I hope my testimony will not sound overly familiar. <laughs> Um, my name is Phil Voss. I am Program Director for Energy Vision. We are an environmental 501c3 focused on commercial and cost-effective options for decarbonizing our economy. Um, <clears throat> as we all know, New York City's 14 wastewater recovery facilities are essential to the health and overall, sa overall health and safety of the city. These plants also make an, an important contribution to our high-level sustainability goals. Here I'm referring to the anaerobic digesters at each of the facilities, critical systems that help reduce the city's greenhouse gas emissions, but which in many cases, as we just heard, need repair or upgrade. We applaud DEP's um, $400 million investment in upgrading the anaerobic digesters at the Hunts Point Wastewater Recovery Facility. Anaerobic digestion is the decomposition of organic materials in the absence of oxygen at wastewater facilities. Sewage is anaerobically digested in sealed vessels over a period of weeks, and by the end of the process, the organic material has been significantly reduced in volume. It is nearly odorless, and it contains much lower levels of pathogens. The process also captures a significant amount of biogas. Biogas capture is critically important as biogas from sewage is 55 to 60 percent methane, a greenhouse gas with 86 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide. Uncaptured, this methane would escape into the atmosphere, accelerating climate change. Wastewater treatment plants that capture biogas generally burn it on site to produce heat and or electricity. Surplus, surplus biogas is flared or burned off. And in New York City, 70% of biogas is currently being flared. There are actually few uses for this raw biogas beyond on-site combustion for electricity and heat. 
but there is an additional option and a significant opportunity for the surplus gas, which is to upgrade it to pipeline quality biomethane. Biomethane can be used for all the same things as conventional natural gas, heating and cooling, electricity generation, or as a vehicle fuel. But its greenhouse gas emissions are 50% or more lower on a life cycle basis than fossil gas. Biomethane from wastewater could be used to heat city buildings or to fuel city or MTA fleets, greatly reducing greenhouse gas emissions from those sources in keeping with our 80 by 50 sustainability goals. It could also be sold to generate revenue for the city, as recommended in a 2018 analysis by the Independent Budget Office. We estimate the city's flared biogas to be worth about $30 million annually. The Newtown Creek facility is, of course, a great example of the possibilities. As we heard, commercial food waste is being added to the digesters, which increases biogas production. Such co-digestion of food scraps is a path towards the city's zero by 30 goal of reducing waste sent to landfills. Biogas upgrading equipment is also being installed at Newtown Creek, and once completed, clean biomethane will be injected into National Grid's network for use by businesses, residences, and vehicle fleets. Upgrading anaerobic digesters across the system and crow-digesting food waste at wastewater recovery facilities has multiple benefits. Improving odor control, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by capturing methane, <laughs> reducing solid waste going to landfill, reducing pollution from the export of food waste to distant organics processing facilities, and as we just heard from Pam Alardo, it also helps improve the quality of the biosolids produced and thus their saleability. Upgrading the biogas captured by the digesters would provide a renewable source of clean energy that the city could use or turn into revenue. Energy Vision encourages the committee to recognize the importance of upgrading anaerobic digestion infrastructure across our wastewater system, and we encourage you also to evaluate the production of biomethane from captured biogas. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. As you, as you just heard, I was asking many of those questions. So. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you both for your testimony today. I much appreciated. Thank you. I'll, I'll see you both out there, as, whether it's at a school or whether we're talking about wastewater or, or you know, resource recovery. Uh, we will definitely, I'll see you, look forward to seeing you both soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have one last uh, person to testify, uh, Melissa Eichen. <laughs> Made it just in time. <laughs> I didn't realize how fast this was going to go. It's unprecedented. Okay. All righty. Good morning. My name is Melissa Yashan, and I am a senior staff attorney in the Environmental Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. NILPI's Environmental Justice Program works with communities who have shouldered the disproportionate burden of pollution in our city for decades. I am pleased to be here today to highlight the opportunity our city has to immediately invest in environmental and green jobs resources through increasing fundi funding for these opportunities in the budget, but also through the long overdue work of divesting from over Funding, overfunded discriminatory systems of law enforcement and corrections. New York City has prided itself on uplifting the values of equality, fairness, and respect for its 8 million residents, all while pushing a vision of a more sustainable future. We are grateful to Chair Constantinides and this committee for their courage and leadership in continuing to push the city towards a greener future. But for a future with true environmental justice as part of the vision, we need to think about restorative justice for our EJ communities, as well as those who have been impacted by law enforcement and the criminal justice system. The current proposed budget reveals the city's misalignment of its priorities and continued failure to put its money where its mouth is. Each budget cycle, New Yorkers passionately and articulately make the case for desperately needed funding for supportive services, education investments, after school programming, housing, health care, youth programs, green spaces, and more. And yet, in every budget cycle, most advocates and city agencies walk away with only a fraction of what is needed. Every time that happens, gaping holes widen in our social safety net. Income and opportunity gaps continue to widen, and law enforcement agencies are once again relied upon to respond to challenges they will never be equipped to address, challenges of public health, poverty, and inequality. 
Every budget cycle, you, our elected officials, have the opportunity to change this pattern. Today, we look at our public health struggles through an environmental lens, and we ask you to take a holistic approach to the budget process and push the mayor and the rest of the council as a whole to stop funding reactive law enforcement agencies to address social and public health problems, and instead fund reparative solutions that invest in those communities who have been over-policed, over-incarcerated, and suffer the highest rates of asthma and respiratory illness due to the concentration of polluting facilities in their neighborhoods. Only by making this shift can New York City truly end the tale of two cities. We all want to live in, a health, in healthy and safe neighborhoods, and our communities have long had the solutions, but not the support. The Build Communities platform, launched in January 2019 and updated just last month, draws on the collective wisdom of over 40 organizations and more than 200 residents of communities most impacted by mass incarceration, which happen to also be the communities with the most polluting infrastructure and highest incidences of asthma. This platform highlights areas of need, as well as many programs that are already working, but in need of greater investment. I'm pleased to share a copy of that platform with you here today, if you haven't already seen it. One particular opportunity included in this platform, which I want to highlight today, is Renewable Rikers. This committee recently heard the three bills, intros 1591, 1592, and 1593, collectively known as the Renewable Rikers Act. The Renewable Rikers Act is the first step to turn the Renewable Rikers vision into a reality. The Renewable Rikers vision is a key part of the Build Communities platform. Community members and organizations came together and agreed that the most just solution for the future use of Rikers Island would be to build sustainable and renewable infrastructure structure that would shift burdens out of environmental justice communities while moving our city to a cleaner and greener future. Underlying this agreement is the basic premise that any future use of Rikers must benefit the communities most impacted by Rikers Island and our city's unjust system of over-incarceration. New sustainable and green infrastructure on Rikers Island can replace polluting facilities in these same communities. That would open up space within these communities that residents can use as they see fit, whether for green space, community services, or affordable housing. All of this is more than just a pipe dream. Yes, we can and should pass the Renewable Rikers Act in the immediate future, but we can do more. This year's budget allocates more than $14 billion annually to the NYPD, the DOC, as well as to the NYC Department of Probation and District Attorneys. If even a portion of this were to be invested in the first steps necess necessary for DEP to begin remediation on the island so as to set it up for beneficial and renewable uses, we could begin the first steps of righting so many of the wrongs the city has continued to repeat for decades. We need you, the council members who understand the importance of funding truly meaningful priorities, to urge the mayor to make the boldest step he can to, towards a truly more sustainable, more equitable, fairer, and more progressive city. Thank you. Oh, thank you, as always. I, I think we share many of these goals that you've testified to today. That makes me very proud. So we will continue to work together very closely. I look forward to it. Now. As do I. And I'll take that. <laughs> All right, so with that and seeing that we are, we have no one else left to testify, I want to thank our uh, legislative attorney, uh, Samara Swanston. I want to thank our policy analysts, Natalie Johnson and Ricky Chawla. I want to thank our financial analyst, uh, Jonathan Seltzer, for his great work. And thank uh, my colleague, Steve Levin, for filling in for me at the beginning of this hearing. Uh, thank you again, Steve. And of course, my own staff, uh, Nicholas Wazowski, and the sergeants at arms for always doing a great job. So with that, I'll gavel this committee hearing of the Environmental Protection Committee closed. <laughs>